Victorian urban landscape. Uh, as Renee said, I'll be doing a bit of an overview of what's been happening in Melbourne, and I think probably there might be a bit of a common theme across, uh, across the states we're talking about. Uh, this is uh, a bit of a map of uh, the, greater, the greater CBD area, you, you might say. If you, uh, if you know Melbourne at all, you'll be able to pick out the, uh, the MCG on the eastern fringes. You can see the ports and you can see other things. Uh, some of the stats there, and uh, they, they match a bit of what Renee was saying. Uh, Melbourne's currently looking at 100,000 people per annum population growth. And uh, what those stats are telling us is we're going to have 450,000, a need for 450,000 more apartments by uh, 2051. And uh, we've now got to that point where permits granted for apartment dwellings have exceeded permits for detached houses. And if you know Melbourne, Melbourne's been the city of detached houses, you know, the ever growing. Uh, suburbs uh, growing out further and further. So that's a significant change in the way uh, Melbournians are starting to live. Uh, those numbers on the maps uh, represent developments that are either under construction or have received planning approval. I think uh, there's a typo there, it said the permit's removed, but it's actually permit approved. Um, across the CBD um, and into some of the northern suburbs, down into Docklands and even down into one of the new precincts called uh, Fisherman's Bend, which I'll talk about shortly. Uh, you can see that number 13 sitting on the northwest corner of the CBD fringe. That's part of uh, one of the growing areas of the city where, uh, where there's uh, been a lot of scope for renewal and redevelopment of uh, what was originally a fairly tired uh, and more industrialised part of the, the CBD. Development opportunities in, uh, in Melbourne. Um, there's been new, new land set aside, and this is one of the luxuries that Melbourne has to deal with that population growth and, uh, and with that need for apartment growth. So uh, starting at the very top, Arden Macaulay Renewal, that'll be more a low-rise area. It's a, a sort of an older suburb of Melbourne, uh, around North Melbourne and Macaulay. Uh, there's a new railway station and railway line that'll cut through there that'll regenerate that area. But the, the, uh, the sites that are, uh, are looking at some much more significant development, if you look at Egate, that's former rail yards, now defunct, uh, which will be redeveloped into commercial and residential. It's a site area of 20 hectares, not insignificant. Uh, if you look uh, the little dot middle right, uh, Queen Victoria Market, which I think David's bid goes in today or tomorrow for 10 o'clock today, the redevelopment of the car park, um, right on the city fringe, uh, a great precinct, a really great opportunity. Only a hectare, but there's still, uh, still great opportunities there. The uh, wholesale fruit and vegetable markets, the new one after seven years of delays, opened in Epping, uh, I think officially this week. Uh, that will probably be handed over to port, um, port occupation rather than development. Um, but along with that, the, uh, the Port of Melbourne um, an initiative of the current government is to be leased, uh, I think, for 100 years, and the funding for that is going to pay for new infrastructure, in particular removing level crossings and, uh, and doing a new rail link. And then down the very bottom, you can see the Fishman's Bend Precinct. Um, I'll, I'll bring up another map of that shortly. That's 455 hectares. It's sort of... Uh, it's two, it's two times the city in area. It was the Holden factory, it was the government aircraft factory, it was various industrial uses right on the south side of the river in, uh, in Melbourne. And that is now, uh, well, already redevelopment is starting, starting that area. Um, most of these sites will go predominantly residential in the current market. Um, on the, that last map of the city, all of those approvals, very few of those would be for anything other than residential. There isn't, I don't think, a current live commercial office development that's, that's um, got any legs in the CBD at the moment. There's just no, uh, there's just no demand. And I guess uh, developers nowadays don't have the appetite to, uh, to build one unless they've got a tenant, uh, a tenant locked up. So they're very long lead time projects. Whereas apartments, um, you can go to the market, you can pre-sell, you can get your sales up and you can, uh, you can jump ahead. So most of those are going to be residential. And apart from residential in the Melbourne construction scene, um, there is a little bit of re, uh, retail work. 
Um, I guess the CBD has been uh, pretty much done now with Moran Emporium for large-scale uh, developments. But the, the big suburban shopping centres, Chadston, Eastland, High Point and whatever, have, uh, have major works uh, going on, as they always do. They need to reinvent themselves. Uh, this is a, a more detailed map of that Fisherman's Bend uh, precinct. Um, and what that shows you is the, uh, the heights that have been set for various developments across there. So you can see a mixture of, of low rise, four levels, up to maximums of 40. That 40, 40 level uh, height, 40 storey height limit was imposed by the, the new uh, ALP government only in the last two or three months. Um, before that, the, we were more looking at 50, 55 storeys or thereabouts on some of those sites. Uh, a couple of overseas developers who had bought sites um, pending planning approval have now walked away on the basis that um, the, heights have, the heights have been pulled down. Um, one of our challenges in Melbourne, and I'm sure it's the same in other places too, is every time you get a change of government, you get a change in, uh, in attitude to planning. Um, we have really, um, I guess you might say, multiple planning authorities, uh, City of Melbourne, uh, but all the major stuff, anything over 25,000 square metres, and these new precincts typically have uh, go through, through through the state government departments. Um, getting consistency in planning and certainty is one of the challenges for our uh, our market going forward because um, it puts a lot of uncertainty um, in development for uh, developers like Grocon and everybody else in in the town. You you uh, if you're in the middle of an election cycle, you don't really know where you're going to be after after the next election. As you can see, Fisherman's Bend, massive opportunities, and some of those developments are, are in for planning or even in design uh, right now. Once you get outside the CBD, uh, there is also a lot of apartment development uh, going on in Melbourne in, uh, you'd call it the inner ring of suburbs. So we've just highlighted some of them there, Collingwood, uh, Footscray, Richmond, South Yarra. Um, Collingwood and Richmond, you're probably talking 10, 10 to 12 storey maximum, less on some of the sites. Uh, South Yarra, there's the odd site that is going, uh, going taller, but typically the same sort of mark. And Footscray is a bit like South Yarra. Some sites taller, uh, but mainly around that uh, six, six to ten storey mark. All of these suburbs have existing infrastructure. They have tram services. They have rail services. Um, they, they, apart from South Yarra, the others all have former industrial occupations, old warehouses and other things that are... I guess great, uh, great for redevelopment, and the population in those areas is growing, uh, growing enormously. Just to finish off, the other thing that's, uh, I guess, the other initiative, uh, which has uh, again been brought in by the uh, the current government, is uh, new infrastructure to help service uh, and provide uh, better transport opportunities for that uh, for that growing population. So you can see there we've got the new north-south rail link with five new stations, uh, starting from that Arden Macaulay uh, precinct. You can see where Regate is there, just where it starts. Uh, running through Parkville, which is uh, where the hospitals and Melbourne University are, so it gives a train service to the university. And then two more stations on the north and the south end of, uh, of well, um, of Swanson Street in the city. I guess CBD South is really integrated into the Flinders Street station. And then a new one heading down towards, uh, towards South Yarra, improving those north-south uh, rail links through the, through the city. Um, if we'd been talking about this a year ago, we would have been talking about an east-west east -west road link, which was the favoured uh, development of the previous government, uh, which tenders were awarded. I'm sure that even made the, uh, the news up here, but was in the end cancelled when there's a change in government. Again, one of those issues, uh, no certainty. Policy changes, uh, throwing our industry in particular into, uh, into turmoil. Um, just in closing, you can see um, population growth is really fueling Melbourne, and it is very much based on that apartment sector. If we didn't have that in the Melbourne, uh, in Melbourne construction and design industry at the moment, there wouldn't be much happening uh, at all. The hospital, uh, hospital work, there's been a lot because health healthcare is, is ever growing. Uh, but beyond, uh, beyond the residential, uh, and I guess you'd throw into that mix aged care and student accommodation, uh, very little happening. Um, but it is happening, at least, something. Thank you. Um, that's uh, the overview of what's happening in Melbourne, and now I'll introduce David Waldron to talk a little about uh, some particular projects. Thanks, David. <laughs>
Thanks very much, Phil, um, and good morning. Uh, I'd like to start by uh, acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which we meet, uh, and I pay my respects to their elders, both past and present. Um, consistent with um, <coughs> a view that we hold, I would suggest if we turned our mind a little bit to the way the traditional owners looked after the land on which we now live and work, uh, we might have a slightly fewer problems in our cities. Um, when I was asked to uh, speak to you today, uh, Renee was kind enough to give me a reasonably broad brief and then narrow it down to, in only Renee's way, a very specific focus. Um, so these are the things I'm going to talk about. We're running a little bit behind time, so I'm going to go really quickly. Uh, and then there's some Q&A at the end. First, the ad. Um, this is Grocon Skyline in Sydney. We built those projects. This is Grocon Skyline in Brisbane and the Gold Coast. We've cheated here. We've put the Gold Coast right next to Brisbane, so there are more buildings <laughs> in the picture. Uh, but one of the key objectives we have is to make sure that there are a whole lot more of these next time we meet, and there's work happening on both sides of that at the minute. Uh, and this is what Renee's actually asked me to talk about, which is Melbourne, and what's the context in Melbourne from a developer point of view. Um, as most of you will know, Grocon is a developer a design and construct contractor and also a funds and investment manager. So we see the whole spectrum of it and I'm going to be reasonably blunt. Um, <clears throat> first, the question, how are cities responding to urbanism? I figured the only word in there I really needed to check was what's the definition of urbanism? Um, <clears throat> and this is the one that came up, you know, Google it. Um, and what that gave me was, was a problem and in fact three problems. If urbanism is a typical way of life of people who live in cities, it locks us into the question of what's typical. And in Australian cities at the minute, my view is, our view is, we've got a radical transformation of what's happening in the cities and therefore typical is atypical. The cities are fundamentally changing and therefore the typical way of life is not what you would expect it to be if you looked backwards 10 or 15 years. Ask yourself what the typical way of life of a person who lived in Brisbane City was 10 years ago, and you're probably going to struggle to find a very big cohort to do what's typical. That'll be radically transformed in the next little while, certainly the case in Melbourne. Then the question of, if we're looking at how do cities respond to urbanism, the question is who enables that response? Uh, again, coming to a new world environment, Melbourne, Sydney, Brisbane, all of Australia, Asia Pacific. Uh, my view is that the enabler of that is the private sector. The big bad developer in the room is the person that has built the cities of Australia. Uh, the question that we need to pose ourselves in the context of how cities are responding is in what context is that happening? What controls are in place to enable it to be good quality development as opposed to any quality development? Um, and then the question of, well, we're all in the room because we're interested in development, design, construction, uh, beyond shelter, what do buildings really contribute to the question of life in the city? So what's happening? This is, um, I, I now need to acknowledge that I've been on the web. The one thing about residential development in Melbourne at the minute is the minute somebody sniffs a project, there's a beautiful rendering on the web and you can download it. So I am um, acknowledging the work of some wonderful practices in what I'm presenting today. I'll be very clear about what's ours and what's not. This is not. Um, this is the work of Fender Katsalides. This is Australia 108, and this is a marketing image of the project. But it sums up what's happening in Melbourne at the minute, I think, incredibly well. This is what's happening. It's up, up, and away. Uh, we're dealing with a CBD that is seeing the rise of the investor. Uh, and um, we think that there are effectively two purchaser types as a rise as a consequence of what's happening in our cities at the minute. And they're easily categorised the ill-informed and the informed. Uh, and I think you'll find that comes into the marketplace up here. The ill-informed has a view of life that says, what's the rental return on that investment? What's my capital uplift? I don't care where it is. I don't care what it looks like. I don't care what's in it so long as I can put a tenant in it. And at a point in time, I get a financial return on it. Some of these guys you could show the drawings to and they would not know the difference between the cupboard, the toilet, the bedroom and the lounge room. It's simply a financial equation for them. Then there's the informed investor. This is all off the plan stuff and the informed investor is likely to be an owner occupier and is equally likely to not be in the CBD. The CBD, in my view, has been vacated by owner occupiers. 
So what's happening broadly in Melbourne is that we've gone beyond the planning boundaries. As Phil's already talked about Fisherman's Bend, the brave new plan of the last administration, fabulous 50-storey towers, we're going to redevelop dozens and dozens of hectares, it's going to be great, change of government, oh, it's not going to be that tall, it's going to be somewhat less. Uh, and whoops, by the way, we forgot to allow a significant public realm in that redevelopment, so maybe the developer should own that or maybe there's a contribution, we're not quite sure, we'll work it out later on. The other thing we're finding in Melbourne, not sure whether it's an issue up here, is the rise of importance of the Civil Aviation Safety Authority uh, because nearly all of the buildings I'm about to show you punch through the height limit that controls emergency plane movements through Essendon Airport. Uh, the infrastructure of our cities is working much harder. Arguably it can work much harder, but there are questions of equity and who pays in that conversation. Uh, and the last point, the dream is changing. And, and here I need to get a little bit personal with a story. I was chipping at my 20-year-old son the other day about the fact that he's doing this fabulous degree at university, he's having a wonderful life. How about you get a job, son? How about a bit of part-time work and so dad doesn't have to continue to support you? How are you going to get a deposit for a house? At which point Alex turned to me and he said, Dad, you simply don't get it. You're in the industry and you don't get it. My generation has given up on the idea of purchasing property. We are renters forever. I do not need a deposit. You blokes, your generation, has taken property to the point where we will no longer be able to own property. That was somewhat earth-shattering for his father, I've got to tell you. But actually it's quite interesting when you look at development that's happening in the city. Um, it is impossible to talk about what's happening in Melbourne without visiting the Allenberg Fraser webpage. And the next few images are images of what's happening in the city. Phil talked about projects that have planning approval. Some of them sold off the plan, some of them in the process, some of them into construction, some of them started and stopped. Um, and here are just some images taken off the web. This one I'll pause at. This is a project that we know very well. This is the former Carlton Brewery site at the top end of Swanson Street. Um, this has all been reported in the AFR, so there are no great secrets coming out of this. The core, we, we bought the entire Carlton Brewery site for round numbers $36 million from RMIT University. We developed one of the projects I'm going to show you a little bit later. Uh, we subdivided the balance of the site. We sold this corner on which this tower is sitting for $36 million some time after we had bought the site, so there is a time lag in there that might justify some of the uplift. Uh, we sold it with a development plan in place but not a planning permit in place. The development plan gave rise to a tower this big. The purchaser, having spent $36 million on the site, went and got a planning permit and immediately sold the site for $72 million. Uh, this development is now underway as a development. But why I've paused here is what's a significant shift that's come in the last 12 months is that the project's being sold from the inside out. So there's been quite a significant shift in the marketplace in Melbourne to the hero image giving way to what's the amenity in the product that you're selling in the CBD. So you get lots of images like these, and these are taking pride of place as opposed to images like that. <clears throat> Here's another one, another one. And here's another interesting insight. I find it interesting anyway. Here's a project that was brought to Melbourne down in the Docklands by Lend Lease recently. But when I say it was brought to market in Melbourne, not one single product was targeted for sale in Melbourne. The entire marketing campaign, all of the marketing material, was focused on sales into China. So the brief to the marketing consultant was that all of the imagery, all of the language, and all of the text had to have appealed to a marketplace that was international, not local. And it's gone incredibly well. Bang, sold, on to the next one, exactly the same brief. Uh, and as Phil's mentioned, we've got this new frontier. So it's Melbourne, it's laneways, it's the grid, it's the culture of the city, it's the gold rush, uh, and now we're down in Fisherman's Brand. All of that industry that used to support Victoria, now gone, uh, and we're going to be residential developers of uh, brownfield development. So that's my context. Um, a little bit about us and therefore where we're going and where we see it heading. Um, this is Eureka. Uh, it's notwithstanding people in the room who know they've built the tallest residential building in the Southern Hemisphere. This has the tallest apartment in the Southern Hemisphere. 
but not for much longer. Uh, there's a significant component of integrated artwork in this. There's a public give back in the form of a sky deck up the top uh, as a visitor place and a uh, venue. Uh, and to a degree, although I hate the word, it's become something of the Melbourne icon. On everything of marketing material, there's the spire on the art centre, which would have been great if we'd built the original one. Uh, a couple of shots of a city grid and Eureka. But the city, for us, is not all about just those things. Here's another project, which we're incredibly proud of, and we've done one in Brisbane as well. This is called Common Ground. This is a project that we built for the not-for-profit sector housing associations to give back to society accommodation within our cities for people who need a hand. So this was designed specifically for people with special needs who have suffered chronic homelessness and otherwise very low-income people, 135 units, and it's investigated the difference between a building that is a house and a building that is a home. And if you think about where you live, you would say, I'm going home, I'm not going to my house. And there's a difference in there about the support network that's about around you, about the way you identify with that place, what it means to you to live in that place, as opposed to just bricks and mortar. The difference between house and home, for me, is lost in the apartment conversation at the minute in Australia. Um, we're actively seeking more projects like this one at the minute. Um, here's another project, which just illustrates there. That's not a render, that's a building. Uh, and this is a building that's at the uh, northern end of the Swanson Street access through the Melbourne CBD. Uh, and it features the image of William Barrack, uh, the last of the um, Wurundjeri, the tribal land owners of Melbourne, traditional owners of Melbourne, uh, the last of their kings, Narangitas. Um, a fabulously successful project, uh, thanks to somebody in the room that recently won a significant award in Sydney. Um, it's a finalist in the International Council of Tall Buildings and Urban Habitats Awards. 536 apartments, integrates with the public realms, refurbished historic building next door. Uh, and just some quick snapshots on the left hand side there of some of the common area features which we put in the place of primacy in the development for the residents. Uh, this project at 536 apartments settled within a round about a six week period. 90% of it settled within the first three days, just to give an indication of a heat that's in the Melbourne marketplace. Of the 536 apartments, there were eight defaults. The eight defaults resold within a two week period. Um, beyond the idea of it's just apartments, what else could we be doing? What's in the future for us? Um, <clears throat> We're actually not interested in playing in the space of the giant towers in the city where you buy a block of land for 36, flick it for 72, and someone then develops it at 72 mil, which means you can't have real quality. The numbers just don't work. Um, we've gone the other way. So we've said, as a base position on all of our residential developments, they will support the Homes for Homes model, which is the big issues taking putting a rider on every title that says when you sell that property, that apartment, one-tenth of one percent of the sale price goes into a trust. The trust's sole purpose is to develop housing for people who have suffered homelessness. Uh, we've adopted the livable housing guidelines and said every single residential project that we control will be certified against Livable Housing Australia guidelines. And most of you will know they're guidelines for people with special needs, be they access for parents with strollers or people in wheelchairs or people on walking frames. It's a fundamental briefing requirement of ours. Uh, we're particularly interested in sustainability and what that means and I will venture to suggest in the residential marketplace if you try and sell sustainability you get absolutely not one dollar from purchases, not one. Consequently, Green Building Council of Australia's Green Star tool has gone fabulously well in every other sector but it hasn't really worked in residential. And our hypothesis is that the market position is wrong. If I try and sell you an apartment and say it's got X stars, it's really green, it means nothing to you. If I say to you the air inside it is much higher quality, there are much lower pollutants, there's better daylight, the energy efficiency is much better, it's got water efficiency into it, you're probably likely to turn your mind to thinking that's a good thing. So we're turning that position on our head on its head and we're saying all of our projects will meet five star, green star certified design and as built, full stop, no, no question about that. Uh, and now we're solving for how do you do that in the most efficient way and still achieve affordable product. Uh, and I can't finish a conversation without, in Melbourne without talking about the standards debate. So under the previous regime, there was a very significant move to it can be whatever it likes, get out your cookie cutter, stamp it in, can you make it taller, churn them out. 
Uh, Richard Wynne, new Minister for Planning, has introduced this discussion paper around better apartment standards. SEP 65 in Sydney, which might be talked about in a little while, is a very prescriptive guideline for residential development. In Melbourne, it's performance-based. Who assesses that performance is a very interesting question. And I suspect Melbourne and Brisbane have got a lot of concurrence in the way the planning authorities structure. So this question of how do you set minimum standards is a really interesting one for tall buildings and apartments generally. Uh, and finally, a couple of quick shots. Uh, this is a project that's um, applied for a planning permit in January last year. The minister at the time, or at least his delegate, said to us when we arrived with the drawings, can you make it taller? This was the planning permit application after 10 months. Change of government, new minister, rejected, too tall. Um, here is the development now approved. I would argue, very publicly, that this is a much better building, the one you can see under the cloud, than that one. I think he's right. I think it was over the top. It's working on an average uh, area of about 150 square metres per apartment. This is targeted at people who will live in the city and own in the city. And otherwise, we're leaving the city to the people who want to pay ridiculous amounts of money for it, and we're working in that fringe that Phil talked about, the donut from South Yarra around to Richmond, around to Collingwood, around to Footscray. To give you a sense of it, the price range on a per square metre, square metre basis, if you start at the Footscray end, six to six and a half thousand, you wind the dial around to South Yarra, exactly the same construction cost, but you're selling it at somewhere around about 12 and a half to 13. So very different markets as you work your way around. Uh, not at all a tall building, so perhaps not at home here. This is six storeys. This is in the suburbs in Melbourne. Complies with the planning scheme. Outrageous that we would propose six storeys in a commercial zone in the suburbs. So this isn't even going to be advertised. The council's going to reject this. It's going to go straight off to the uh, planning jury judge in Victoria for assessment. Uh, and another one just in Williamstown. So exactly the same idea. Let's go and do some work in the suburbs, in and out much more quickly. Planning scheme, relatively speaking, more certain, uh, and come up with a different model and a different approach using that brief that I talked about. And I'll finish there, Renee. Thanks very much.